Hey, hey, Marcus Housewitty here, and today we are talking about SpaceX's Starlink network and the potential new plans that have popped up over the last week. Now, if you don't know what Starlink is, I'm not going to explain it here in too much detail. I do have another video if you'd like to watch that first, linked up here in the top right. Along with all of the awesome Starlink news, we're also going to touch on all the amazing things going on with Starship. So let's get started. So some super interesting news this week with Starlink. As stated on the website, SpaceX's upcoming Starlink network will provide fast, reliable internet to populations with little or no connectivity, including those in rural communities and places where existing services are too expensive or unreliable. So SpaceX have this year started their long-term mission to create a low latency telecommunications network. Back in May, SpaceX launched its first initial set of 60 Starlink communication satellites which was the first of the total proposed 12,000 satellites to be launched in upcoming years. Not only that, the next Starlink launch should be happening very soon with a schedule currently suggesting the next set to be launched in October. No big deal, right? 12,000 satellites screaming around low Earth orbit at over 75,000 kilometers an hour. Well, get this. Apparently 12,000 satellites is no longer adequate for SpaceX because new documents with the International Telecommunication Union have been filed looking to launch up to 30,000 additional Starlink satellites on top of the 12,000 already approved by the Federal Communications Commission. So wait, 42,000 satellites, well over three times the number already approved under construction. Now, these filings are essentially the first baby steps in the process of deploying a satellite network. In most cases, this step happens years before any launches occur. When it comes down to approvals from the Federal Communication Commission, a lot more detail will need to be included, just like they were required to do with the already approved satellites. Now, back when I last talked about Starlink a few months back, the most common concern was regarding two things. Firstly, that SpaceX could trigger a Kessler syndrome scenario where two colliding objects in orbit generate debris, which then collides with even more objects creating even more debris until the entirety of low Earth orbit is an impassable array of junk. Secondly, the most publicized issue I think were of course concerns over potential light pollution with ground-based astronomy caused by the satellites. Now, both of these issues are fair arguments, but there are plans to mitigate both of these issues, which I'll touch on shortly. Obviously, these concerns were in regard to the 12,000 approved satellites. Now though, we're talking many, many more. So if people were worried about the Kessler effect or impacts on ground-based astronomy before, the concerns are probably going to be amplified by this new potential proposal. Now for any astronomers out there, I'm interested to know what you think about this. Do small satellites impact you already within optimal viewing times, or is a lot of this concern in your opinion not warranted? Let me know what you think in the comments. The immediate question that people are going to be thinking here is, why so many? What can SpaceX achieve with 42,000 satellites that they can't achieve with 12,000? Well, a number of online articles have a reply on this by a SpaceX spokesperson saying, as demand escalates for fast, reliable internet around the world, especially for those where connectivity is non-existent, too expensive or unreliable, SpaceX is taking steps to reasonably scale Starlink's total network capacity and data density to meet the growth in users' anticipated needs. SpaceX here certainly seems to be anticipating some big increases in demand globally for its upcoming broadband services. Presumably, the initial approved plans must have only covered a small percentage of the potential demand. Total assumptions here, but I suspect the initial 60 that they've already launched have worked very well to the point where SpaceX can see a clear benefit to a much larger network than they'd planned. In the filing, SpaceX said that the additional 30,000 satellites would operate in low Earth orbit orbit at altitudes ranging from 328 kilometers to 580 kilometers, so similar altitudes to the original 12,000. 
But when and where are we going to be able to sign up for SpaceX's broadband services? Initially, the plan is that the service will come online in the northern United States as well as parts of Canada sometime next year after enough of the satellites have been launched and joined the network. Enough at least to have a reasonable coverage over the area. The longer term plan is to grow the network to cover most of the world over the course of the first 24 launches. This is going to mean a lot of launch activity over the next 12 months, which is frankly going to be awesome. We haven't seen a Falcon 9 launch since the Amos 17 mission back at the start of August, which seems like an eternity by SpaceX launch schedule standards. Assuming that each launch will be carrying 60 satellites, we're talking roughly 1,440 satellites for this initial phase of the global network. I can't wait to hear some real reports from the first people joining up on this network to hear what the overall response may be. Now previously I've heard a lot of comments claiming that the speed or a network in low Earth orbit such as Starlink compared to city fiber would be poor and useless. But this is not the target market. The target market is mainly areas of low connectivity or where the services are very expensive and there are plenty of these areas worldwide. Now getting back to the topic of space debris, one factor that people may not be aware of is that there will be sophisticated software controlling the Starlink satellites themselves. This software will crunch data to detect and mitigate potential collision events and as stated on the Starlink website, the satellites utilize inputs from the Department of Defense's debris tracking system to autonomously perform maneuvers to avoid collisions with space debris and other spacecraft. This capability reduces human error, allowing for a more reliable approach to collision avoidance. Now, this is going to be critical if the network keeps growing to such a degree. The network itself is placed in quite a low orbit as well, so even if a collision does occur, the debris should all re-enter the atmosphere and burn up within five years or so. As a Starlink satellite runs low on fuel after its useful life is over, the plan is to have them de-orbit over the course of a few months and be disposed of in the atmosphere. Because of all these smarts, Starlink claims to be on the leading edge of debris mitigation, saying that the plans meet or exceed all regulatory and industry standards. So this is all pretty amazing news. What I'm interested in now is just how much revenue SpaceX could potentially pull in with such an extensive network. Will it be enough to fund SpaceX's core goal to colonize Mars? Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm sure plenty of you have run some numbers on the potential speed and bandwidth that could be offered with 42,000 satellites. Of course, to keep up to date with Starlink, Starship, and all other SpaceX content on my channel, please do hit that subscribe button. It really does help me to keep creating this content for you. There is a huge amount to keep up to date with, especially over the next exciting 12 months of SpaceX development and launches. Over to news on Starship's development now. There is a great deal going on around Florida and Texas. This drone footage of the Mark II Starship from John Wincup is always incredible. Thanks very much, John, for providing such amazing footage. I highly recommend following all the content John is putting out from Florida here. It really is fantastic material, and we can see quite a bit of detail here in the most recent footage. As we can see here, the bulkhead is back out of the vessel again and being worked on. It also seems to me that we're seeing these first bands of stainless steel being placed on a new stand here. Many of the new ring segments we see scattered around the facility, I suspect, will be joined here to create the Mark IV ship in Florida. Some beautiful photos from Julia here are also incredible. Again, follow Julia to keep up to date with her amazing content as well. Now, we can see a lot of intricate work going on here. Fin mounts have appeared recently along with all of the intricate plumbing running down the sides. Continuous work around the nose cone is still occurring as well. Now, I've heard a number of people suggest that the Mark II version is way behind the Mark I in Texas, but this may actually not be the case. As we all know, the Mark I was constructed very rapidly for Elon Musk's presentation, but since then, most of the parts of the Mark I have since been removed and are now scattered around the site. This is what the Mark I looked like just after the presentation, and this is essentially what it looks like right now. So what we're seeing here is really very similar work going on in Boca Chica in the same areas that we see on the Mark II. Again, loads of plumbing work being done here to run all the cables and lines 
down the length of the vessel. Boca Chica Gal posted some more great photos on NASA spaceflight, so more great contacts to be following there. A lot of work going on around the nose of the vessel here, and in fact they've had to trim a segment off the top of the nose here, presumably to make a wider entry to add or remove new components, or just to make it easier to work in. So this to me just goes to show how much is yet to be done, and I think we may actually be seeing about the same progress from both construction sites. They've just done things in a different order. Regardless, loads of progress going on, and we're all hopefully going to be seeing some more substantial changes to both ships over the next week. I hope you enjoyed this video, if so please do take a second and hit that like button. As always a massive thank you to my quality control squad shown here. I simply can't do what I'm doing here without the support and if you're interested in these topics and would like to be involved in the growing community, follow my discord or twitter link in the description. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my Starlink video from the other week. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.